welcome to our worship. Hope you're all doing well. Hello everyone. We're glad to be here again. It's another month of June. Welcome to June. Welcome to me. I'm just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> but, uh, I hope uh, everyone is enjoying the warm weather. It's been hot here in Brentwood this week, but it's going to cool down a little bit this coming week. So it's going to be fun. But everything's well and um, I hope uh, you're also enjoying and just uh, getting used to the new normal that we have. Um, we've been uh, going to the gym this week and uh, mm -hmm. started to enjoy working out together. Uh, it's not uh, very scary as we thought it would be, but uh, being vaccinated and all, uh, we felt safe uh, going there. And it's not very crowded also when we go in the morning. But anyway, um, our service today again is uh, um, we will have a message from Dan Rogers. I'm uh, still waiting for his post, but uh, we'll see what he comes up with uh, as the message uh, for today. So um, let's open in prayer first. Dear God, our Father, we thank you once again for this wonderful and beautiful day that you created for us. Thank you, Father, for being our loving God and uh, just uh, merciful and full of grace, uh, God and Creator. And you've uh, demonstrated this to us, your love for us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and this uh, revelation is uh, continuing to be uh, um, manifested and revealed to us through the Holy Spirit who is with us. So thank you, Father, for your love and for all the blessings and and the fellowship and the relationship that we enjoy um, with you and with one another. So we pray now, Lord, for uh, this service, for your blessings and for um, all our sick brothers and sisters, especially Hazel uh, Roberts, who is now in a um, recovery um, uh, facility and we, we pray Lord for uh, your uh, blessing on her and uh, healing and also for uh, wisdom upon Mr. Roberts on the next steps and the next places uh, for Hazel to go to. So we pray Lord for your um, healing upon all the others who are sick among us and we know that uh, you care for them and uh, know what is uh, happening in each of them so we just lift them up before you as we continue to uh, uh, remember them in our thoughts and prayers every day lord we uh, just give you glory again for this service and we thank you so much for your love in jesus christ most holy name amen Amen. For our worship songs, we will start with All Hail the Power of Jesus Name, followed by You Are For Me. And for our closing song, we will have I Surrender All. And for our scriptures, we have Psalm 138 verses 4 through 8 from the Passion Translation. One day all the kings of the earth will rise to give you thanks when they hear the living words that I have heard you speak. They too will sing of your wonderful ways, for your ineffable glory is great. For though you are lofty and exalted, you stoop to embrace the lowly, yet you keep your distance from those filled with pride. By your mighty power, I can walk through any devastation, and you will keep me alive, reviving me. Your power set me free from the hatred of my enemies. You keep every promise you've ever made to me. Since your love for me is constant and endless, I ask you, Lord, to finish every good thing that you've begun in me. Amen. Amen. That's beautiful. So let's, let's worship, worship together. Enjoy.
So faithful, so constant, so loving and so true, so powerful in all you do. You fill me, you see me, you know my every move, and you love for me to see. Have you ever felt like you're at the bottom of the ocean crying for help? In my many years of pastoral ministry, I have encountered many people that find themselves in this circumstance, expressing their deepest pain through a fountain of tears. Maybe you're in over your head, but no one even knows you are struggling. Or maybe you have sunk so deep in despair 
that you think no one could possibly hear or understand you. Sometimes it's a deep wound in our soul that even we can't wrap our mind around or see any possible healing from. Or maybe we have fallen into some deep-seated sin that seems impossible to overcome. For many of us, we may be looking around, reading the headlines, and feeling that the entire world is too broken, torn, and distorted to be pulled out of the mire. We all have a cry from the deep. The question is, will we be heard? The psalmist encouraged his soul and ours with the reminder that the Lord does not keep a record of sins, but rather he forgives and therefore can be trusted with all our deep brokenness. Listen to his cry from the deep. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. When God forgives, he doesn't just overlook our situation with a flip and dismissal. Neither does he observe us in our deep pit and ask us what we did to fall in. No, he climbs down into the pit with us in order to lift us out. How far will he climb? All the way to the very bottom, further in fact than we think we have fallen. He gets below our brokenness, underneath our wounds, as far down as necessary in order to completely redeem us. He descends below our depths to raise us up into new life without any hidden deep-seated scars to leave behind. This process sometimes requires waiting on our part, but we can wait in hope knowing that the Lord does hear us and answers us according to His deep, redeeming love. Redemption is the Lord's work and He has already heard our cries from the deep. Jesus voiced those cries for us on the cross, and our Father answered Him with resurrected life. The Father's redeeming touch can't get any deeper than the death of His own Son. The answer of the resurrection assures us that not only does He hear our cries from the deep, He will also answer. Mi nombre es Eber Ticas, Hablando de Vida. Was Jesus insane? Now, for Christians, that may seem like a ridiculous question, even a blasphemous suggestion. However, some, including some who identify as Christians, do not accept the divinity of Jesus, and some do believe he was insane. There have been a number of scholars and doctors who have questioned Jesus' sanity over the years. Among them are the French psychologist uh, and chief physician of Paris, Charles Benet Sangle, and American psychiatrist, William Hirsch. Their premise goes like this. If Jesus really existed and the Gospels can be believed, and Jesus thought of himself as divine, then Jesus suffered from megalomania, paranoia, schizophrenia, multiple personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, manic depression, delusional disorder, and elitism. Some would suggest that Jesus, while not divine though, was a great teacher and a great moral example that we should respect and imitate. However, the problem with that line of thinking is, as author C.S. Lewis, among others, suggested, and again, based on the precept that Jesus existed and the Gospels can be believed, 
that based on what Jesus said, either he deceived humanity by conscious fraud, he himself was self-deluded and self-deceived, or he was divine. As Lewis put it, there is no getting out of this trilemma. It is inexorable. So we're faced with the questions, Jesus, lunatic, liar, Lord, mad, bad, God. We're going to see from our story today in the Gospel of Mark that during Jesus' lifetime, some considered him to be insane, including his own family. We're going to look at Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 35. But first, we need to get some context for our story from the Gospel of Mark. As we pick up our story today, Jesus has made miraculous demonstrations of his authority and power by healings and by exorcisms, that is the casting out of demons. Now some have reacted positively to Jesus and thousands have begun to follow him for healings and more miracles. I mean, it's like this guy heals cancer. This guy feeds lunch everywhere we go. Let's follow him. Now, out of his followers, Jesus chose 12 to be his very closest disciples. But there was also a negative reaction to Jesus' popularity with the masses from his opponents. The Pharisees and the Herodians sought to kill him. The cosmic forces of evil were out to betray him, to defy him. And he received persecution, and a negative reaction from his own family. So we pick up the story today in chapter 3, verse 20, as huge crowds begin to follow Jesus wherever he goes. So Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Then Jesus entered a house, or he went home, probably to uh, Peter's house in Capernaum. So Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. So imagine this, they probably packed the streetway outside. They, those who could got into the house. They filled the house with people. Everyone wanted to get close to Jesus, uh, to hear what he had to say, to touch him, to receive a miracle, uh, to get some food or whatever. And the place was so crowded and so packed, and so many people were asking questions and talking that Jesus and his immediate disciples uh, couldn't even eat. So this was the situation they were in. Verse 21, when his family, and the word here can be translated in a number of different ways, but family is probably the best and correct translation here by the context, as we're going to see later in the story in verse 31. So when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him. Now, his family was in Nazareth, and so they heard all the way there from Capernaum on the shores of the Sea of Galilee up into the north country. Uh, they heard what was going on with Jesus. They heard these stories about what Jesus was doing, what Jesus was saying, and the thousands of people who were following him, and they decided they'd better go and as the English version here says, take charge of him. Uh, the Greek word there is arrest him, take hold of him, put him under arrest. We might say today, we need to send him to a hospital and bind him up because he's crazy what's going on there. Now, so they wanted to come and take hold of him, to arrest him, to take charge of him. For they said, listen to this, he is out of his mind. Exeste in the Greek, we might say today, insane. So Jesus' family said and thought that he was insane. Why? Could it have been a sincere concern? That's possible. Uh, could they have felt we hear he's not even eating, he's thronged by crowds, we're concerned for his physical safety, he's not 
taking good physical care of himself. We need to go get a hold of him. Uh, maybe they heard what he was saying and teaching and they disapproved of his ministry or his passion and devotion to ministry. Or maybe they were afraid that what he was doing was going to come to the attention of the Jewish religious leaders in Jerusalem and maybe even the Roman authorities and Jesus was going to be in trouble. Perhaps the whole family would be in trouble. So their motives may have been well-meaning, but the bottom line is Jesus' family thought he was insane. So they decide to go from Nazareth down to Capernaum to get a hold of him. So now we have an interlude in the story. Verse 22. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem, the teachers of the law, that would be the scribes, scholars, professors, experts at law of the Jewish traditions. And they probably had been sent by the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, uh, to investigate this Jesus. I mean, here's a man who's teaching, who's attracting a following by the thousands casting out demons and performing miracles we'd better investigate this and of course there was uh, the book of Deuteronomy talks about how that kind of behavior does need to be investigated uh, lest a whole town or whole village be seduced by evil so these scribes came down, you always come down from Jerusalem because it's on a hill. They came down from Jerusalem and they said, He is possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons he's driving out demons. Now, first we might notice that they did not deny his power. They did not deny the fact that demons were being exorcised, cast out. What they did question was the source of his power. The source of his power was the Holy Spirit. But they were saying the source of his power was Beelzebul. Now, who in the world is Beelzebul or Beelzebub, as some translations have it? In the Old Testament, the primary term used for the evil foe of God is Hasatan, the adversary or the accuser. In the New Testament, the Greek term diabolos is often used as well. Diabolos meaning devil and literally meaning a slanderer. But the term Satan in the New Testament is also used as well interchangeably with diabolos. Now the name Beelzebub is also used and is likely a contemptuous name given by Jewish tradition and found in both the Old and the New Testaments. And it describes a God worshiped by the Philistines called Beelzebul. Hello. <laughs> it's nice to see you all here. Now, as the more perceptive of you have probably realized by now, this is hell. <laughs> and I am the devil. Good evening. <laughs> But you can call me Toby, if you like. We, we try to keep things informal here, as well as infernal. <laughs> That's just my little joke. <laughs> now, Beelzebul meant Baal the prince, or the Lord of heaven. But Beelzebub is a play on this name and means Lord of the Flies, probably used by uh, Jewish tradition to mock and to be pejorative about this so-called God of the Philistines. So instead of Beelzebul, they called him Beelzebub, meaning Lord of the Flies, with the implications that flies eat dung. So all of these terms, Diabolos, Devil, Satan, Beelzebul, Beelzebub, are all interchangeable and they all refer to what we call generally the devil. All right, back to Mark chapter 3. So they said, by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. 
So Jesus called them over to himself and began to speak to them in parables. Now, by the use of parables here, it means he's going to give comparisons to uh, explain logically why their accusations are false. So he began to speak to them in parables, saying, <clears throat> How can Satan, now notice they called him Beelzebul, Jesus immediately says, yeah, I know who you mean, Satan. How can Satan drive out Satan? Illogical. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Now, interestingly, probably the kingdom of Satan is divided against itself and it will not stand. But he's posing them a question in logic to get them to think about what they've just said. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. It's probably true. Even though he wants them to think about it, negatively, it's probably a truism. So, its kingdom is divided, he cannot stand, and his end has come. Hmm. His end has come. So if Satan is casting out Satan, what you're saying is his kingdom is divided, it's going to fall, and he's finished. Is that what you mean? <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, is that, yes, that is exactly true, because in Jesus, Satan has been defeated. Oh, he's still around, but he has been defeated. So his end has come, and he uses this example. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house, using Satan as the strong man. No man can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up, binding him. Now, the symbol of binding evil is as old as the Old Testament itself, and the Jewish folk understood exactly what Jesus meant here about binding up. And of course, we read in the book of Revelation about the binding of the devil. So he is bound up. So you can't go in and, and rob the rich man's house if you don't first bind him up. If you see the, the kind of the metaphor that Jesus is making here is that I am casting out demons. I am casting out Satan and all of his henchmen. I couldn't do that unless I have bound him up. Unless I am the stronger one. Though he's a strong man, I'm the stronger one. I've bound him up. And I'm looting his house. I'm taking away his possessions. I'm plundering his home. And what's he got there? The whole world in his hands. He's got people enslaved and bound. I'm setting them free. So that's what Jesus is talking about here in a parable to the Pharisees and Herodians. No one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, amen, amen, amen. I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander, every blasphemy they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin, an age-lasting sin. Now, what does he mean by that, and how does that connect to what the Pharisees and Herodians are doing here? Well, first of all, uh, don't think that it's talking about people who say, oh, my goodness, I wonder if I've committed the unpardonable sin. If you wonder that, you certainly haven't. <laughs> because if you have, you don't wonder about it. You don't care about it. You don't even believe in it. You don't believe these words. What he's talking about here is they have said that the work of the Holy Spirit is the work of the devil. They know it isn't. They're not deceived. They know that Jesus is from God. They really understand what he has done, and yet they can't stand his authority. They can't stand his popularity with the people. They can't stand his getting in the way of their religious enterprises, and so they deliberately accuse 
the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit at work as being the power of the devil. They deny the Holy Spirit. They deny the working and the power of the Holy Spirit. And thus their sins are not forgiven in the sense that they cannot accept or recognize or believe in forgiveness. Why? Well, Scripture says the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Uh, repentance and forgiveness of sins and the recognition of that comes through the Holy Spirit. If you continually harden yourself, deny the Spirit, resist the Holy Spirit, which Scripture says you can do, then you cannot accept the fact that God has forgiven you. You can't recognize it. You can't believe it. You can't accept it. You don't care about it. You refuse to accept that deliberately and maliciously. And Jesus is warning these Pharisees and Herodians who know better and are assigning the work of God to the devil that they are in serious danger now and for the ages to come. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They're guilty of an age-lasting eternal sin. Why? He said this, verse 30, because they were saying, and here we have the imperfect tense, which means it's ongoing, which means that it, it's consistent, that it's just the, the way they're doing it, not one time, but consistently and always, because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Jesus had the Holy Spirit. They were calling the Holy Spirit impure, unclean, vile, evil, the devil. And to resist the Spirit like that, to harden your heart, is a very dangerous, very serious matter. Now our interlude is over. We come back. Verse 31. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. They had come from Nazareth to Capernaum, and now with the interlude of the Pharisees and the Herodians, uh, we now have their arrival. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, interestingly, they were outsiders. They were non-believers at this time. Now, later in the book of Acts, we find out they became believers, at least some of them. But right now, they, they don't believe Jesus. Now, to be fair, let's say, uh, if you have a brother or a sister, but let's say you have a brother, and your brother comes to you and says, uh, Hey, James, got something to tell you. Yeah, what's that, Josh? Uh, I'm the son of God. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, I'm the Messiah. You're the what? Yeah, uh, I do miracles. <laughs> I cast out demons. Yeah, even the demons obey me. You know what? I can walk on water. Mom, Mom, you better come and get Josh. He has gone out of his ever-loving mind. So we can kind of expect, in some sense, humanly, that those closest to him, those who had grown up with him, who'd seen Jesus from the time he was a young boy, now to adulthood, and he begins to say these things about himself and do these things, it's, it's a little hard to swallow. It, it just doesn't make any sense to them. So indeed, they are outsiders at this point. And they believe he's insane. So his mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. They couldn't even get through the crowd. So they passed the word along, probably. Oh, somebody killed Jesus. His mother and brothers are here. So just passed the word along. So a crowd was sitting around him, Jesus, and told him, Hey, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Hmm. Verse 33, Jesus says something. Very interesting, and I think it has the tone of disappointment to it. Jesus' response is, Who are my mother and my brothers? Now, notice there's no Joseph here. We assume that he has passed on by this time. But you can almost hear the disappointment in Jesus' voice as he says, Who are my brothers? Who is my mother? He asked. Verse 34, then he looked at those seated 
in a circle around him, his closest disciples, the 12, maybe some of the women who followed him, but his very closest disciples in a circle around him, being taught, listening to his teachings, the ones closest to him. And he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Here, my disciples, those who believe in me, those who don't think I'm insane, <laughs> those who believe I'm telling the truth and that I am who I say that I am. And he says in verse 35, whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. A new definition of family, not by blood, but by spirit. Those who do my father's will, they're my real family, my true family. Not to just put away his physical family entirely, but to call a new kind of family that's even closer, a spiritual family. You know, God is not a family, but God has a family, and we are his adopted children, and Jesus Christ is, as Scripture tells us, our older brother. And that is why we are brothers and sisters in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. So what should we understand from this story today? Well, there are a number of things we should understand. <clears throat> we understand that there have been and always will be those who deny that there is a God and those who will deny that Jesus is God, that Jesus is divine. And they will say that those who believe that Jesus is God are ignorant, superstitious, and are insane. There have always been and always will be those who deliberately call evil good and good evil. There have always been those who deny God and who refuse to recognize and accept that he's forgiven them. We should also understand that God created the physical family as a great blessing for humanity. But Satan, from the very beginning, has sought to disrupt and divide families. We also understand that Jesus opened up the meaning of family. Not only does God wish for our physical families to be united in love, but he's also opened up the opportunity for all humanity to be family, to be family through Jesus Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And this spiritual family is even far more united in love than our physical families are. You know the old saying, I'm making it up, spirit is thicker than blood. Spirit is thicker than blood. So we conclude, Jesus was not insane. He was who he said he was. And when we accept that, and believe and respond to the Holy Spirit, we become a spiritual family. Those in whom the Spirit dwells are a spiritual family. And we are a spiritual family, sisters and brothers in Christ, now united in love and united in love as sisters and brothers for all eternity. So, I conclude today by saying to all my beloved sisters and brothers in Christ, may God bless you. Amen.
benediction the amazing grace of the master jesus christ the extravagant love of god the intimate friendship of the holy spirit be with all of you amen